My message today is entitled Daniel and the Sovereign God, Part 9. Daniel's Prayer and the 77s. This message, of course, is based on Daniel, Chapter 9. We're in the ninth chapter of Daniel, and once again, we have made a time jump. In Daniel chapter 6, we were in the Medo-Persian Empire. That's where Daniel got rescued from the lion's den. The last two chapters were a flashback to Babylon. But now, we're back in what we would call Daniel's present time. Darius was king at the end of chapter 6. He's king again in chapter 9. We're nearing the end of Daniel's life. But there's something else that's coming to an end. God, through the prophet Jeremiah, told the people of Judah that they would be exiled for 70 years. And so the time of the exile is nearly up. Again, if Daniel went into captivity around the age of 12, he's now at least 82 years old and and probably a bit older. And so the time of the exile, again, is almost up. Look at Daniel 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. Stop there for a second. There's that name, Xerxes. Now, if you were in the Esther Bible study, you might know Xerxes as Esther's husband, the king of the Medo-Persian Empire. And you might be thinking, so this must be happening after Esther. That's not the case. That Xerxes, Esther's husband, reigned about 50 years in the future of these events. Now this is not all that surprising, right? Men have been naming their sons after themselves and after standout relatives and even after people they just admire practically from the beginning. I mean, if you heard that David Weiss served in the army in Luxembourg in World War II, you would not assume that was me, that was my grandfather. Likewise, if you heard that David Weiss served in the army in the Vietnam era, you would likewise assume that was not me, hopefully. You would assume that was my father. And if you heard that David Weiss just finished his potty training two or three years ago, please don't assume that was me. That was my grandson. So Darius' father was a man named Xerxes. And it appears someone in the future named this future king after Darius' father. So the father of Darius was not the same Xerxes as the one we read about in Esther. Everybody clear on that? The line of the Medo-Persian kings is admittedly somewhat confusing. Some think the name Cyrus was actually a generic name for king. And that this Darius that we're reading about here was actually also known as Cyrus the Great. My study at this part left me a little bit confused, but suffice it to say, the Medo-Persians had taken over. The Israelites were now living under the Medo-Persians. This Darius that's referred to here is the same king that was duped into putting Daniel in the lion's den by his jealous advisors, and that the Xerxes we know from Esther came much later. At this writing... Darius is just starting his reign, so we're likely a little bit before chapter 6 yet. We're a little bit before when Daniel was put into the lion's den. Look at Daniel 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Verse 3, so I turned to the Lord God, and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. So here's what's happening. Daniel is seeing that the exile is coming to an end. He knows that God is faithful and he will soon allow the Israelites to return to their homeland. But Daniel also lives among the exiles. And he knows the condition of the people. He knows what they're like. And it appears he knows they're not ready. Daniel knows it's time to pray. And as he prays for the nation, he prays and he fasts and he prays in sackcloth and ashes, a sign of mourning. Now think about this. Have you ever watched a video online of something that's just happening and you sit there and you watch it and you think, this is really amazing or this is really scary or whatever. And then you realize, I wouldn't be seeing this 
if somebody didn't record it. it. It looks like something just happened randomly, but then you realize somebody actually set this up to make sure I saw it. Well, think about this. How is it that we know what Daniel prayed? Because he recorded it. And since all scripture is God-breathed, Daniel recorded it because God the Holy Spirit led him to record it. Prayer is usually just between us and God. But God wanted us to know about this prayer. Now I'm a person who believes that God's timing is perfect. And, and as I was feeling led to put this series together. It wasn't like I sat with my calendar and said, this is the perfect message for election day. I can tell you I didn't do that. And yet here we are. As a matter of fact, were it not for me getting COVID, Galen Hackman would have been here last week. And I would be a week behind. Right before what I see as a pivotal election in our history, it has been orchestrated that I would be preaching on one of God's greatest prophets praying for a nation in turmoil, a nation he loves and cares for deeply. Maybe this is much more than coincidence. Friends, this much I know. We who love the Lord need to be in prayer for this nation. I mean, I'll tell you, I love this country. I really do. I believe this country is a blessing from God. I do. And I feel blessed to live here. Is it perfect? No. But it's good. And yet nearly every day I look at what's happening and I think, what are we doing? Much like ancient Israel fell away from the Lord. In many ways, so has this nation. But we who love the Lord need to be in prayer. It is not too late. There is hope, but the time is now. So let's look at how Daniel prayed. First of all, once again, he is in mourning. He was old enough when he was taken captive to remember what it was like to live in the promised land. He knows how far they have fallen. They had 70 years to turn back to the Lord and get ready. God in his mercy told them how long the exile would be and what they should do while they were waiting. And it appears through all that time they haven't changed. It's as if they haven't learned their lesson. Well, we have lived in freedom. And in many ways, we have lived in God's blessing. The question is, do we take God for granted? I wonder how long God can bless this nation when we continue to do things that God would be totally unjust to bless. Look at verse 4. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. Stop there for a second. We spent the last two months talking about Daniel, talking about this amazing man and how good he was, and he was good. He had a relationship with God that most people would envy. And yet, he is confessing. He knows he's not perfect. He knows he's a sinner. He even knows he has a part in Israel's guilt. And so he confesses. He goes on, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Think about this. The prayer starts in verse 4 with adoration. Telling God how good he is. Now let's be clear, God knows he's good. He is perfect in every way. He doesn't really need us to tell him that. So why do people recommend that we start prayer off with adoration? I think it's twofold. I think it's twofold. First of all, he is worthy of our praise. He doesn't need it, he needs nothing from us, but he is worthy. In good times and bad, he is worthy. In freedom or captivity, he is worthy. And for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, he is worthy. Till death brings us together, he is worthy. But there's more. When we give God adoration, it turns us from pride. We see him as he is, and we see what we're not. 
And that leads to confession. Look how Daniel says this. Verse 5, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. We, he's including himself in this. And friends, so must we. We have a part in the sin. And you might want to look at some of the grievous stuff that's happening in our world and say, Pastor Dave, I'm not doing that. I know you're not. But church, why are we here? We are here to point the world to Jesus Christ. I can't speak for you, but there have been times where I have been silent when I should have spoken. There are people that I haven't shared Christ with yet. I believe Jesus changes hearts and minds. I believe that salvation changes the course of our lives. I believe that changed lives change things, and yet I have been silent. And there have been times where I've sinned. And there have been times where I've been part of the problem. And times when I didn't do what I should have done. Sins of omission and commission. And I have been silent when I'm pretty sure God wanted me to speak, but I've also spoken when God wanted me to be silent. Try as I might, and I do try, I haven't always represented him well. So when I look at the mess we're in, I have to confess. I share in the guilt. How about you? Look at verse 7. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. Do you see it? This nation that we live in has been blessed beyond measure. And how are the people thanking God? <laughs> By living defiantly and sinning boldly. God has been disinvited into so many places. God's not even welcome in polite society in most places anymore. His law has been removed from our courts. We are sacrificing our children to the gods of our day. We live in ways that deliberately mock God. And we expect him to be okay as we sin with abandon. We live in ways he cannot bless and demand he bless us anyway. And the list goes on and on. Ephesians 5, 11 and 12 remind us, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. This is the world we live in. Dark and shameful stuff is happening in this dark world. But folks, Remember, there's a source of light too, and it's us, Ephesians 5, 13. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Guys, we are in this world to reflect the light of Jesus. We are in this world to light it up. These dark days are our time to shine, church. Verse 14 of this same passage, Ephesians 5, is our wake-up call. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And in verses 15 to 17, it tells us what to do. Be very careful, then, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish but understand what the Lord's will is. Oh, people, this is huge. This is huge. Daniel, all those years ago, is in prayer for his people. He was likely walking with God more than most, as we'll see as we move along. But he's not acting like he's above them. He is by their side, and he is repentant. Paul here in Ephesians calls out to the church to light up this world. And he tells us how to do it. He says, understand what the Lord's will is. 
He told us that we can know what the Lord's will is in Romans 12. Remember, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. I take that to mean if we're going to live in God's will, it will require us to think differently than the world. We simply can't afford to be like the rest of the world. We need to let God change the way we think. Isn't that what Daniel's saying? From confession, Daniel goes to a little more adoration, where Daniel reminds himself and us about what God is like and what we're like. And then right back to confession. Look at chapter 9, Daniel 9, verse 9. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written, verse 13 says, in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster on us. For the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Understand what's happening. This is what we call owning it. Daniel is saying, all that stuff my people have faced, we deserved it. Every last bit of it. We have no one to blame but ourselves. You told us, God, what would happen if we went that way, but we defied you and did it anyway. And now that we have been through it all, nearing the end of our punishment, we still have not turned back to you. No wonder Daniel's in mourning. He sees the sin. He knows the law. He knows all they have been through, and they still haven't learned. Brothers and sisters, are we in the same boat? Daniel is talking about a group of people who have lived under the blessing of God and they have disobeyed him. And more than that, they refuse to obey, to turn around, to repent. Folks, we need to be in prayer. We need to be in prayer. Our God is righteous in everything he does. He hasn't changed and he won't. Because everything he calls sin is truly destructive to the people he loves. To compromise his righteousness and turn his back on his word would be for him to stop caring and to give up on us. Please understand, he is a good, loving father who knows what's best. And we turn our back on him at our peril. We know, we who know him, need to be in prayer. The time is now. Finally, we get to what we call supplication. This is where Daniel makes his request known. Look at verse 15. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. We have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Remember, the God's temple at this point lays in ruins. Daniel's not acting as though they deserve grace, because grace by its nature can only ever be undeserved. If we deserve it, it's not grace. Daniel is saying, have mercy on us for the sake of your glory, for the sake of your name. 
Show us your favor so that people will see your goodness and mercy and turn to you. Look at verse 18. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. That's Jerusalem, which is also in wreckage. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. Why should God act on their behalf? For the glory of his name. Why should God act on our behalf? For the glory of his name. See that the very people, so that the very people, excuse me, who oppose him may see in him the hope found in his name and they might be converted and they might be saved. From here, we get to a passage that I will confess to you is very difficult to understand. It's a passage we call the 77s. Look at verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. So here again, we see the angel Gabriel. And he's moving swiftly. He's moving with a sense of urgency. Right in the middle of Daniel's prayer, God sends his messenger to speak to Daniel. Now remember, Daniel was in the midst of confessing his, his sins and the sins of his people before the Lord. Look what God's messenger Gabriel said. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to you to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Now again, Daniel has put himself on the level of his people, but God says he is esteemed. His prayer is being answered even as he prays. God is saying, I see you, I hear you, and I have been watching you, and I am with you. May that be the same thing he says to us. Then we get to one of those what I call dangerous passages. He says, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Verse 25, know and understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes there will be 77s and 62 sevens. Now many scholars believe these sevens represent seven years. From the time the temple is rebuilt, taken literally, this means 490 years till the anointed one comes. To be clear, the anointed one is Jesus. Now Daniel is near the end of his life and his ministry here. His ministry ends in 536 B.C. Jesus comes in the flesh somewhere between 6 and 7 B.C. and the transition point between A.D. and B.C., which people might call the year zero, but there really isn't a year zero. It goes right into the one year, right? So the number would be off slightly, a couple of years, but not by much. The thing is, I would ask you today not to get too caught up in the numbers because they are likely not exact. Remember, in Matthew 24, 36, Jesus said, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Once again, God's not going to give us exact numbers, because he doesn't want us messing around, trying to figure out when Jesus is coming. God the Father even kept that date from Jesus while he walked the earth. Instead, verse 42 tells us what we should be doing. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house be broken into. 
So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Oh, anyone who's human understands this, right? There's a good reason why God hasn't given us the date of Jesus' return. What do you know about the way most people deal with deadlines? They put things off until they can't put them off any longer. Well, when it comes to salvation, that is a horrible idea because no one is guaranteed tomorrow. So today is the day of salvation. I mean, have you ever met someone who thought they would put off coming to faith until they got much older? Yes, you have. We want to wait till we get older because we still have some sinning we'd like to do. We see faith as restricted. Let me tell you something. Faith is freedom. Faith is freedom. Faith is being able to place your trust in God when the days are dark and cold. Faith is knowing God has you covered and that he will be with you throughout eternity. Faith is realizing that this world might get tough, but that there is light and love and purpose for us here on earth and heaven is forever when that life is done. There's freedom in that. Freedom to face the days knowing that eternal life is secure. Look at Matthew 24, 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. God doesn't want us sitting on our laurels, waiting for the end. He wants us to be actively involved in his mission to draw all people to himself so that none would perish, but everyone would come to repentance. When he comes, will we be found faithful? So don't get caught up in the numbers here. Oh, I'm convinced that the numbers are in some way right, but that we don't completely understand them here. The rest of Daniel 9, 25 and 26 says this. It will be rebuilt with the streets, with streets and a trench. But in times of trouble, after 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Now, who is he talking about here? Well, we know the anointed one is Jesus. But who is this evil ruler that is to come? Some think it was Antiochus IV Epiphanes. And it probably does refer to him. Others say it could refer to the Roman general Titus who destroyed the temple, burned Jerusalem, and annihilated many Jews in 70 AD, and that's also pretty likely. And some say it refers to the time of the end and the Antichrist. Which one do I think it is? I think it's all of the above. I believe God is showing Daniel things that are to come. I think he's showing us Antiochus. I think he's showing us Titus. I'm almost positive he's talking about the Antichrist as well because of the proclamation of wars at all, to all the way to the end and the desolations and all that stuff sounds a lot like what John writes in the book of Revelation. But what convinces me most is in this last verse. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the, the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed and poured out on him. This seven, this last seven that we're talking about, this is the great tribulation. For a while, it will look like the Antichrist brings peace. But in the midst of it all, he cuts off worship of the one true God and sets up his own image in God's temple. Yes, those will be bad times on planet Earth. But they will bring about the time when God sets everything right forever. And that is where we must place our hope, folks. God is faithful. He shows us over and over again that he knows what will happen. And he has promised to make it work for our good. For the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I don't know what will happen in the next ten years. I don't know what will happen on Tuesday. And the way things are going, I don't think anyone will know what happened on Tuesday, at least not on Tuesday. 
I don't even know what will happen in the next 10 minutes. But what I do know is who holds the future. I know who is sovereign over history, and I know he is faithful. I know he keeps his promises, and I know he loves you. He loves you. Trust him. Serve him. And do not be afraid. Amen.